My name is Terrell Vernon, Associate Head Coach, St. FX Men's Basketball, and you are watching Undress the Jersey. And now we're live. So, so, right. so, tell, so tell me what's going on. How's, uh, how's everything in Anaganish? You're in Anaganish, right? I am, yeah. I am. And that's, that, that must be because that must be pretty quiet, especially not just because of the, the coronavirus, but I know or everyone knows after the school year is done in the summertime, the NIST just drops dead like a fly. Right. So, so what, so what, what, what have you been finding yourself uh, to do keeping busy? Um, well, again, I've got the six month old at home, um, kind of popping in and out um, uh, of the office a little bit. And then also just kind of, you know, trying to keep in touch with the guys as best as we can. Right. So um, as much as zoom calls, um, trying to get creative with it, doing different scouts, um, you know, from games from last year and, you know, mm. getting guys to understand a little bit of personnel for guys coming up the next year. Um, and just getting guys up to speed. We have some new guys. So just trying to um, just get everybody on the same page as best as possible with everybody not being able to, to get together yet. I like that because, because, like that's something that I never did as a as a player when I was there, and I don't know if it's just special to the circumstances that we're facing right now, but the fact that you guys are staying connected throughout the summertime when everyone's at home, and then having be having the ability to do these video sessions are so important because I remember as a player the only sort of communication we had with the team or coach was like Facebook Messenger, and that was only to to put input on what we were doing in terms of workouts or shots and that kind of stuff. But other than that, there was no real like connection or even team building. Like have, have you felt that that's been uh, helpful or beneficial to you guys as, during the off season? I think, I think it has, um, you know, if it was, I think if it was every single day, I think it would get a little bit drawn out. Um, mm. but we kind of, we're trying to spread it out as much as possible where guys can kind of be fresh, come back, you know, enjoy seeing everybody's face again on the, on, you know, on the zoom call. Um, but at the same time, you know, giving them something that can challenge them a little bit, mm. um, like whether it's, you know, it could be anything, you know, um, leadership qualities, right. What is What does our leadership look like going into next year? What is, what are some challenges coming up with, you know, with COVID and, um, you know, being able to be flexible and understand that, you know, things can change and. Um, how do we adapt to that and instead of just kind of being stuck in our ways? So um, just trying to be as fresh as possible. And um, But again, guys have been a, do, doing a good job so far with that. Um, in terms of, but you know how it is, you know that off season is, you know, guys go home. Um, it's tough to get everybody kind of on the exact same schedule. Mm -hmm. because everybody has different things going on. Um, right. But I think, you know, um, I think, you know, with me, me, me specifically, it's like, I just want to see what guys look like when they come back. You know right. what I mean? It's just like you could we could try to see, you know, with the you know, we try to track as best as we can what they're doing in the off season, but you know, you know how that goes. Like guys can try to you know, write it down or not write it down or whatever the case may be. But you know, when guys show up in in September or August, you're gonna know whether they did it or not. Absolutely. And and that's something that I always held on to as a player because especially in my later years and where I, I, I held on to more of a leadership role you knew like sure you might be able to bullshit the coaches here and there but the, your teammates like guys knew who was putting in the work and who wasn't and and for me my biggest thing was like okay i'm not going to i'm not going to babysit you and and you can't babysit someone and then like like you said it just all comes down to how they show up if they're going to show up ready and you had guys that did show up and then you had guys that didn't show up, and then that's where the coaches come in, come into hand. Um, I've had I've had I've had a few calls with, especially with with Frosty and being on like the top of the food chain podcast and all that kind of stuff. We talked to Donko and Gary Gallimore and all these guys and and T Bear. And I kind of want to get your perspective on it and just how valuable is it to stay at school for the summer. Because those guys, T-Bear especially stands out to me. He said he became the player he was because he stayed in Anaganish during the summertime because it just forced him to go to the gym, go home, eat, stare at a blank wall, and then decide to go back to the gym. 
I don't know if you've had any experience with that as a player or, or even any insight that you have on university teams that encourage that and, ha and have guys stay on campus throughout the summer. Well, for sure. So I know that, you know, at near the end of our season, we had a lot of guys committed to stay for the summer. Um, it was going to be more than more than usual, with, you know, with COVID and stuff, it kind of changed everything. But mm. um, I think that's a great point. You know, if you can stay, you know, with the coaching staff and get a regular schedule with what you're doing. Um, you know, some guys, some guys can go home and have, you know, that type of structure and schedule, but it's sometimes it's tough depending on where you're going home to. Um, so, you know, if you, if you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're saying, Hey, listen, if I go home, I'm not going to get the same structure that I'm going to get with, if I could stay, you know, stay on campus. So I think it's, um, I think it's one of those things like myself, um, when I was playing, um, you know, first I was at McMaster and then I, you know, transferred out to, mm -hmm. out to St. FX. I didn't, the one summer in between, I didn't stay, but I went home. But when I went home, I already knew because I had already had that structure from when I was at McMaster with Hamilton. Right. I knew that I was going to get my hours in and who I was going to train with and, you know, what I was going to be doing on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis. So I felt comfortable to go home. Now, if I didn't have that comfort to go home and do that, then I would have had to stay. Because at right. the end of the day, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to, you know, we're trying to be the best player yeah. we can possibly be. We're trying to win, you know, as many games as possible. And then, you know, once those five years are up, then you're just talking stories for the rest of your life. Oh, trust right? me, so, I'm, I'm living it. <laughs> I'm, I'm living it for sure. And, and I guess it does come down to personal personal preference or, or who you are and whether or not you have this certain amount of discipline to go home. Because I know for me, especially just throughout this summer, um, when I set my mind to like whether or not I'm going to the gym with Frosty or I'm doing work on under undressed jersey there's these other little factors that's like one of my friends hits me up and says yo let's go to the beach today it's like 30 degrees I know if I go to the beach then it's just gonna mess up my routine for the rest of the week and so that, that's where it comes down to having that personal discipline in order but I guess it it also comes back to prioritizing what it is you want to do like like you just said it's what are you going to do for those five years do you want to actually win games or do you just want to go to St. of X party and have fun and talk to all the girls that makes me think of there was a kind of there's a little bit of chatter when it came to recruits and specifically my fourth year we had the class of like Avon specifically he came to visit and that year we weren't doing very well as a team. And so it was at the end of the season, you know, you start having your recruiting trips and whatever. And I remember specifically Avon like decided not to hang out with the team on a Saturday night because he, he just wanted to diss himself. And then as the year out went on and he committed and the next year happened, guys continually got this vibe that this guy isn't here for this social aspect that he has this, like he's here to, make a point right so it, it does come down to prioritizing what it is you want i guess i had a question written down here is that because you know that you went to x i went to x everyone who hears okay. saint of x knows it's such a drinking and party culture mm -hmm. maybe touch on your experience as an athlete student athlete going to that school but now that you're kind of on the other side how do you balance social life with basketball and, and where does that fall in with your perspective? Right. So, um, I get like when I came from McMaster, um, I actually remember my, my recruiting trip, I came and I went to, I think it was around Halloween, my recruiting trip was around that time. And I went to, um, obviously I, well, I did end up going out with the team, but, um, but I, I, I don't drink. I've never drank. So um, when I went out there, I don't know remember who it was at the party, but they're like, oh, do you want to drink? And I'm like, no, 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 I don't drink. Like, I, I don't drink. And, um, and then the person goes, then why do you want to, you want to come to X? Like, how, how are you going to, how are you going to survive? Yeah. Um, so I just, I, that moment really sticks out when you were mentioning that. But, um, but again, it, it, it comes down to, again, like, what is your, what are your goals? What's more important to you? Right. So, you know, me as a player, that was my thing. It's just like, I knew, you know, coming from where I'm from and things that I've seen, I know what 
you know, social life and alcohol can do to someone's goals. So if, um, if that, that was something where I said, you know, I didn't want any excuses. I wanted to get to a point where, you know what, let me get to where I can get to, you know, with my ability to play this game. And, you know, when the chips, when it's all said and done, I won't have any excuses. I'll know that I did everything that I could possibly done to get as far as I could do it. And then when it's all said and done, I can be okay with that. Right. So um, I think, and that's why kind of my transition, I think, you know, cause I was, you know, my last year playing, I was with the Mass Mississauga Power. And, you know, there's still rumblings about people saying, hey, do you want to come play over here? Hey, do you want to, you know, make a push over here? Want to do that? But I felt like, because I kind of gave it all and then the game wasn't the same. Like I felt like, you know what, my time had passed. I've given it kind of as a player, right. all that I, all that I can kind of, you know, grind for. Then I'm like, you know what, let me go into something else. Right. And then mm -hmm. I think, you know, going into teaching and then it going into the, you know, TRC Academy and then, you know, having the success and then coming back to it, like it happened so fast, but mm -hmm. I think it was just me being comfortable with, you know what, I've given the game everything I can as a player. So now let me transfer this now to give the game everything I can in another nice avenue. One. Nice one. And, and that also takes me back to conversations with the, with the guys like Donko and Gary and T-Bear and all, all these guys that went to play pro. And now I'm looking at some of my teammates who are now in that stage of finishing university and going on to play pro. A lot of the conversations that come from it is that they last one to two years and then they, they transition into something else. But if you were to look at these guys two, three years ago when they were in university, they were just like all basketball. I'm, I'm playing as long as I can until I'm 35, 40 years old because I just love it, love it, love it. And then all of a sudden they enter this new world of pro sports and the fire just isn't there anymore. And the biggest takeaway I got from these conversations were it no longer felt like the sport that I loved growing up and the fun that came with it, it, it now turned into a literal job and you're literally competing for contracts and money. Did, right. did you experience anything? Was that a big part of your experience as a pro athlete and why you transitioned back? It was a little bit of it. I think, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily, you're not playing with everybody who's just playing to win. You know, when you're playing at St. of X, like everything is just, you know, to win and, you know, you're not really looking at the end picture. It's all, you know, what can we, let's try to put a banner on the wall. Let's, you know, let's make a push at national. Let's do what we can do. But I think once you get out there, you, you don't have that kind of control. Everyone's on one-year deals. If you're not, you know, at the highest level, you can get multi-year deals. But, you know, when you first come in that door, you know how it goes. It's just, it's just one-year deals. Everyone's competing for their jobs for next season, not what's going on in that season. And, uh -huh. you know, I'm, you make the extra pass to somebody and, you know, and you think you're going to get another extra pass or, you know, the, like, especially my condition, I'm a point guard. So I'm just looking this holistically. We just got to get a bucket regardless how it happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, guys are taking shots on two guys just because they need to get their field goals in. And, you know, they haven't got a touch in a little while. So they're getting it up and, you know, and then you're losing games because of it. And um, yeah. so it was just, it was more of a business. Um, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. I like the, how, because it's, it's a lot more cutthroat. You know what I mean? You really yes. got to be on your toes every single day, which I enjoyed. Um, it just got, it just reached a point for me was it was a little bit of financial and a little bit of, you know, uh, that, that saying, do I want to play this style of game sure. and keep not knowing my next move, right? Because you'll play a season and you may not know what your next move is for the next few months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me, I don't like that feeling. So it was kind of like, I want to be able to know what I'm going to do from year to year and have a plan or five year plan or right. a four year plan and know, you know, what the next step is to get where I need to get to instead of, you know, I play a season and then, you know, I come home and I train like crazy, not knowing yeah. where I'm going to yeah, be in the world, tough. what I'm going to do. Um, so, you know, I did it for, you know, did it for a couple of years and then, you know, it just got to a point where I'm like, you know what, the money wasn't matching up. To what I was putting into it yeah. so I said you know what I'm gonna go uh I did actually when I was playing with the power I was doing teachers college at the exact same time nice one and so I was driving back and forth trying to do my best with that and then you know once that happened then you know prep school thing happened and then I was a teacher and then mm -hmm. it kind of moved up the way it did let's talk about that in TRC because obviously you kind of 
quote unquote shot on the map when you started having a lot of success at that prep school. Just just tell us like where is that prep school? How how did it come about? Was it always a school or did it just come up in the new surge of prep basketball in in Canada? And how did you find yourself there? Um, so I was uh, so actually I was at the power and then with the power and doing the teachers college thing and I got a phone call um, from the owner and uh, the TRC is in Brantford, Ontario, so it's not too far from Hamilton, about 15 minutes away. Um, so it was a little bit local for me. Um, and they said, you know, they're looking for, you know, a teacher position. Um, right when I was finished teacher's college, I was done in December. They wanted a teacher position for that January. So I kind of jumped in there just as a teacher, kind of like trainer type of deal because their season was already underway. It was their first season underway. Um, but then, you know, after that season, some people left. And then, you know, I jumped up to, you know, the head coach of TRC. Nice um, and then, you know, our first year, um, first year went well, um, we we're kind of underdogs, but, you know, we made it to the finals, uh, lost by, lost by three, I think to Orangeville with, um, like Ignis and some, you know, there's some NBA guys over right. there. Right, right. And, um, then the second year, our second year, uh, we had a bunch of guys back. I think, um, we had 61 guys. We had a few, you know, guys, you know, um, new sport guys as well. We were really, really good. A lot of older guys. Um, and then we winning, we ended up winning it at the second year. Um, and then the third year, you know, we lost six, again, we lost six guys that went on to high level. And then, um, we came back the next year, we kind of retooled a little bit, got some new guys, um, but we were younger. Um, mm -hmm. and then we ended up winning it again. Nice um, which was, uh, you know, it was kind of a, I know we were underdogs the whole season and it was, you know, had some ups and downs, but, um, sure. it was good to see the guys kind of, you know, band together. And, um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the TRC kind of thing. It kind of went fast. It was like, you know, teacher to, you know, mm -hmm. to coach and then coach to coach in basketball operations. And then it just kind of happened real fast. And then, um, you know, and then, you know, having that the success that we had, you know, then, right. um, you know, and always, you know, with coach K, we were always talking through this whole thing. Like my sure. first practice plan at TRC, I, I planned it with coach K. Ah. So, you know, so he kind of under, he kind of knew, you know, what was going on with me at TRC on a, you know, a weekly to monthly basis. We'd right, 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 right. And then, um, you know, when this opportunity came up at St. FX to kind of, you know, the succession plan to kind of make it come in, we've, we've had a great relationship going through so it's kind of exactly serious. how how important is it for a player coach relationship in terms of success individually but also as a team because i think back to some of my favorite teams playing for and it was those were the teams that i had the closest relationships to with the coach um i know especially with you being a point guard and Coach K always talking about his relationships with his point guards and his relation like Randy Noor and all these guys. How how important is that to you as a player, but also now that you're in you're in a coaching position? Um, it's crucial. Like especially when, you know, if you're a point guard and the coach gives you the reins to communicate to the team. Right. Mm -hmm. There's some coaches that, you know, want to communicate everything, and there's some coaches that you know, they want to, you know, empower the player to let him speak. And I, when I, once I got to St. FX, it was very seamless. So, you know, coach wanted me to, you know, give his message. Right. Um, so, and when you, when you, you know, when you have that type of relationship, there's more responsibility. So you're more invested mm -hmm. now. That's right. When you have a, when you have a voice, you're more invested. So um, when I was, you know, when I was here, that's more hours in coach's office watching film. That's mm -hmm. more meetings about what's going on. What what do what do I see on the court? What do, so now when the game is going on, I can go to coach and say, hey, listen, they're doing this, they're doing that. Let's try this. Nice one, right? But if you don't have that relationship with the coach, you're not saying that. You're just keeping in the back of your head saying we should do this, we should do that. But because you don't have that, you can't bridge that, you know, that communication line. Right. Then it's kind of like you're just kind of getting frustrated sometimes as a player. So um, he kind of you know coach was very open to um, you know that communication. And, you know, I kind of brought that to, um, to TRC was, hey, listen, I can't, we're only going to be as good as the players can kind of get right. through this. So it's kind of like, I tried to empower these young guys to make decisions, right, and talk things out, right? I will give you kind of the framework on what's acceptable, and then you guys go out there 
and you guys figure it out. Because if you guys figure it out, rather than just listen to what I'm saying, then it's going to be even better because now we can have more of a dialogue, True. right? Instead of a yes, sir, no, sir, it's a in the moment, yes, sir. But then when we're done, sure, sure, let's sure. talk about it a little bit yes. and let's figure out why it's coming the way that it's coming. Um, so that I think that dialogue is important. Um, and again, all the successful teams that I've been on, I've, you know, at the point guard position, I've had some type of say because now I'm empowered to talk to the coach, but then I'm also empowered to talk to the players on behalf of the coach. Exactly. And I, and it, it creates almost this sort of trust that, that right. the, the worst thing that can happen on a team is when there's a disconnect between the coaches and the players. And I've been on teams or my first, like my first year at St. Vex, we had a, we had a team that was just, the locker room couldn't have been more toxic because there's these, there's, there were specific guys in there that created this, this disconnect and weren't invested. And you could just tell like the whole, that just created this energy within the whole, the whole locker room and the team and on the court that there was just no trust. And it even got to the point where coach didn't really know what was going on until he walked into it. Right. So, so what you're saying is huge. I don't, I don't want to lose, lose your time as a high school coach because specifically in Canada, when you're, when you're playing or when you're coaching a team full of talent and you have, you're playing against teams with NBA guys and guys going to B1, talk about your perspective about kids in Canada, basketball players specifically, thinking that the only, the only way to make it is to go D1, go to the NCAA and go to the States. I had a, I had a conversation with uh, Keza Keen, who's a point guard for Carlton 905. He's over in Europe now. He, he, he had both best of both worlds because at first he, he went to the States. He he played on a couple of different division one, like Cleveland state and whatever. And then he ended up coming back to to Carlton. And it wasn't until he got to Carlton that he was like, it it truly doesn't matter where you go. Basketball is such a performance based sport. As long as you're performing, you're going to, you're going to play. So was it difficult for you to, whether or not you saw a, a player that really, really wanted to go to D1, but he just, he didn't have it, yet he could have made such a difference at a, at a high-level U sports team. How did you kind of, you know, throw that into their ears and say, yo, like D1, you don't, you don't need D1? So um, in my avenue, so I kind of had a different kind of sense of it because like coming out of high school, Right, I had a I had D one offers as well, so when I came out, I was I was an all Canadian, um, and you know, at that time, there was a clearinghouse switch. So when I was in my fifth year, the NCAA had changed over the rules, saying that all of your courses had to be academic all the way from grade nine, and I couldn't go back and change all of those courses in time. So that's what kind of you know kept okay. me in Canada. So mm-hmm. you know being and then being able to, you know, stay home and then, you know, for the first few years, I kind of understood U sports and I understood how, you know, um, you know, if you have, you know, different levels of rope when different types of programs, you can kind of get just as much, if not more than guys that are playing D1. Because I'm more going into summer leagues or, or going into little workouts in the summers against guys that are going D1. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm playing better. I'm better than these guys, right? That's right. So it's kind of like what it comes down to. Um, you know, when I was talking to guys at TRC, because there's, it's a balance, right? You don't want to, if their goal is, is to play division one, you don't want to diminish that goal. Right. Because then you look at someone who's trying to potentially, you know, lessen their potential. Sure. But also you want to give them the kind of realization of, Hey, if this D1 fit isn't good, you need to go somewhere where you're going to develop, where you're going to get, where you're going to play. Um, and at the end of the day where you could potentially make a name for yourself. And I think, um, like if they said, no, my goal is D1 when I was at TRC, it's okay. I'm going to do whatever I can to kind of get you there. Right. Right. But I'm always saying, Hey, listen, if it's not the greatest fit, you got to understand that you stay home and you can get a lot of things, sometimes even more at home than you would get over there. So you guys just need to under, you need to understand that as you're going through it now. There's some people in the industry that are just saying D1, 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 and they're looking at U Sports as the lesser. Now, I don't necessarily look at it that way because if you look at, you know, that national team that just went out and played um, when a bunch of the NBA guys didn't show up, 
a lot of those better players were all U sport guys. Right. Right. Kaza was in there. You had a bunch of a couple of Ryerson guys in there. You had guys from all over. So it was actually more like U sport guys than it was mm-hmm. kind of D1 guys. So you got to understand it's not about necessarily, like, like you said, it's not about where you go. It's about how are you performing and where can you go to perform at your highest level and develop mm-hmm. into the best player that you can possibly be. And that's a tough decision for, you know, 18, 19 year old kids oh, to kind of come out and say, you know, especially when, you know, media and everything else is saying D1, 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 highest level, yeah. highest level. And it's hard to kind of sink back and say, where can I go to be the absolute best basketball player I can be while enjoying my success and having a chance to win and being a part of a winning program? It's tough. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, you actually want to have fun and enjoy your time because the last thing you want is like, like we just touched on when you go to pro, are you put, you're putting in all this amount of work and are you getting the benefit from it? Like, are you, are you actually enjoying what you're gaining from what you're, what you're putting into something regardless whether that's a job or a relationship or or anything that's kind of a that's kind of a conversation you have to have with yourself and it's definitely something that comes up within my own thoughts when I'm listening to all these different stories of different athletes is that if you're not having fun playing the sport that you're playing you kind of have to wonder is it worth continuing putting in now I, again, I bring, I keep bringing up Frosty, but it's because we spend a lot of time together and he's someone who's really good to have discussions with because I don't want to say he, he can be stubborn, but if he believes something, it's kind of hard to crack him. It's kind of hard to like crack a different perspective. And I remember posting something about the term ball is life and how, you know, growing up, you would always hear that term. And if you didn't really believe that, then you weren't a real baller and you didn't really care about the sport or you didn't have goals to to play. And I, I believe that to some sense, but now that I'm done playing ball, I look, I look at it and I went through my last year at X, not having the most fun playing basketball because it did turn into more of a job than it did, you know, like a fun sport to play. And so I came out and said, yo, I, I don't think ball is life is a great, is a great term to use. And if you're not having fun doing the sport that you're doing, you should take a step back and, and, and think. And I remember I said, Will, do you, do you agree with what I said? And he said, yeah, I see where you're coming from, but what are you going to do? Just tell a kid to not chase his dreams. And, 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 and if he has a goal, just don't do it because it's impossible. Not everyone goes to the NBA. What would be your, perspective on this term ball is life and when do you tell a kid to yo you shouldn't go d1 like it's what you should take a step back and realize what you're doing i don't think you i think you just have to educate as much as possible in terms of you know the the decision between the two just be educated give as much educate like as much information as possible just to help them with that decision sure but in regards to the ball is life i remember that growing up too but i think looking at it now it's about it's about loving the game. Mm-hmm. How much do you love the game? That's what it comes down to. It's if you love the game as much as people say they love it, then you'll give the game what the game deserves. Right? So I think that, you know, people say they love it, but when you love something, there's sacrifice that comes with it. Right? Yes. It's not just like so in a weird way, it's like some people are infatuated with the game. They like you know, it looks sweet. It's nice when it's, you know, it's on your own time and it's not taking away from what you want to do and stuff like that. But people who love the game, they really take the time to make Mm -hmm. sure the game gets what it's supposed to get. And so in regards to how ball is life, I get it. But I think people just have to come and sit back and say, hey, listen, instead of just kind of dragging this on here, do I love this game and how much do I love it? Right. And, and, and that's not easy to admit. It, it, mm-hmm. It's a lot of times it's not easy to admit that, you know what, I don't think I love the game as much as I do, or as, as much as I thought I did, or as much as you do. Because especially on a team, how can you, how, how can you have that conversation with someone that 
like with one of your teammates or one of your coaches and, and sit back and say, Hey, I don't really know if I'm willing to put in as much work as required. Maybe I was last year, but this year something's changed because then they don't think that you're committed to the, 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 the team or the game or winning and, and whether or not you're willing to sacrifice that much. I, th I just think that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to do. And that's why a lot of people don't have those conversations. Yeah. And then it is, it is tough, but it's almost one well, in my mind anyways, it's respected because if someone loses that love for the game, why, why would you still want, like, don't put them in that situation to kind of feel uncomfortable about right. being around something that they don't really want, are passionate about being around. Mm. So, um, and that's like, and that was me as a player. Right. And that's me as kind of a coach now was always like, you know, like, shoot, like when I was growing up, I thought there was like a crew of like six or seven guys that, you know, we would have made it all the way to the end. Right. We would have made it all the way to our first pro contract. I thought there was no way we're not going to make it all the way through. And then come to find out, like when I'm getting my contract, I'm the only 88 right. in the whole city, you know, that, that ended up getting a contract. And then now I'm at that spot where I'm, you know, I'm playing at that level. And I can't find anybody to train with. Right. I can't find any other pros to train with. Like Shay wasn't, Shay was young. I was, you know, working out with the Shay's age group back in the day. And, you know, all these young guys that are going on these high levels now, they were just kids. So like myself, um, I had to go down to like Tyrone Watson, um, who's two years behind me, he plays okay. with the, you know, uh, Hurricanes. He plays in the CBL, okay. plays overseas. But that was kind of like I had to go down age groups to mm. kind of work out with guys that were kind of on the same level because my age group kind of just, you know, it kind of just stopped. Like they kind of hit a level about, and they're yeah. like, you know, they didn't want to get to that. They didn't get to that next level. Right. So, and not to say, again, not to say that they didn't love it. I just think that it got to a point where the love ended. Right. right. And, and you gotta, you gotta weigh that out. Right. If you're at university now and, and I'm a coach and you know, you have schoolwork and you have, um, you know, practice and you got travel and you got games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it gets to a point where, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, can't give no more to this game like this that's a conversation we got to have because because uh, like, that just means for one you need to be in a good space yourself mentally to make sure that you're happy and your and your your health is good right and two you want to make sure that you know you have to enjoy this sport right and mm. you know sometimes you know you can kind of get through it or like kind of talk your way through it and feel good for the for a week or two and then maybe it comes back in the next little that's while right. after that um, but I just think that, you know, if you have a love for the game that, you know, can you have a goal saying that, listen, I'm going to take this game as far as I can possibly take this game until I can't do it anymore until I hit that wall, then, you know, I think you're in a, you're, you're in a decent place in this game. You know what I mean? Exactly. I think, um, you know, like I said, like I sacrificed a lot to get to where I was right now. Did I make it to the NBA? No, but because I, gave it everything that I had, I was okay yeah. with hanging it up. And I'm okay going into practice and not putting my shoes on and just coaching. Because I know right, some guys right, will right, go right, in right. there and be like, especially guys like I'm watching the CEDL thing right now that's on mm. the, uh, on CBC. And I'm seeing a bunch of guys that I've played with are my age, still okay. playing, still, you know, still fighting for the contract. But I'm like, right. I watch them play and I'm like, I don't. Miss, mm -hmm. I don't miss that. Like, I don't want, I don't know if I want to be there with them right now. Like maybe I'll be there as a coach or, you know, be on the sideline, but I don't feel like I have to be in those lines. So same thing with St. FX, the same thing as that TRC is like, I think maybe my first year at TRC when guys were not doing what they were doing, mm -hmm. I would kind of jump into practice and just show them. Like I'd want to right. show them physically how it works. And then as the years went on, I kind of, you know, found my way to just explain it with my voice you know, show them a little clips here and there through film um, mm -hmm. just to kind of break myself away from that physical aspect. Which is important, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, but again, man, I think it just comes down to the love of the game. How much do you love the game? And that will decide how much work you're going to put into the game. I love that. And, and that sums it up 100%. And that sums it up for things outside of sports too. Like, again, you, we, we could dive down different rabbit holes, but at the end of the day, if you're not loving something, to the point that if your love doesn't match your ambition, then that's when you need to have that conversation with yourself. Because I, I could sit here all I want and say, oh yeah, my, my dream was to go play for Duke as a kid. And then by the senior year of high school, I was just like, you know what? 
I'd rather go to a, a, I'd rather go to Saint Evex where I can have a bigger impact, not just on the basketball court but in the community as well. And and so far, I just I just I just truly believe that things work out the way that they're supposed to, even though even though you may not know it in the moment. So it's tough. It's tough. You need you, you can't overjudge yourself and overjudge your decisions and all that kind of stuff. You mentioned your 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 six month uh, newborn. Con- congrats, by the way. Appreciate that. How how has that affected your perspective on life and sports? Because, like even me right now, if I go back two years, a kid was not even in my mind, and it was just ball, 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 university, social. But then I can I can only imagine that once once you have have a child, that kind of shifts. And again, does like fact the ball is life you kind of realize that no ball isn't really life like right. my my son or daughter is right um no i think this it definitely changes you kind of right away like um just like how you plan and organize your day because now it was you know before the baby was born it was kind of like okay i'm gonna be in the office i'm gonna be at practice and i'm gonna watch more film and i'm gonna get home i'm gonna watch even more film and then right you know then i'm gonna you know let's do a workout here let's do so now it's just kind of it gets to a point where you got to, you know, you have to prioritize your day. Don't get me wrong. You still have to get the work in, but mm-hmm. I think it's just now, you know, you have to make sure that you make time for family. Um, you know, with, with COVID happening, but when it happened, you know, don't get me wrong. It's been, you know, horrible for, for a lot of people and um, even for my family as well, but you know, it's kind of kept me home to kind of enjoy what it's like to be at home with, you know, with your newborn son and, um, and enjoy that time and um, you know I get to see a lot of things you know he's growing on the day I get to see it all right, right. so COVID's kind of you know giving me an opportunity to kind of see those things um, and it kind of gives me perspective on you know when he is you know when things go back to normal right I gotta come home there has to be daddy time there you mm-hmm. know what I mean I can't you know just keep doing what I'm doing and not 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 have that time you know to make sure you know he always knows that you know dad's there um so i think that um you know i think it does definitely a change because you know it's no longer living for yourself or you know it's living for your wife it's kind of it's, it's, it's a different feeling man it's you know it's someone that you have to you know um kind of guide through kind nice. of an uncertain uh, uncertain world you know so nice one. um definitely different so but um, but again i'm enjoying every day of it and um again man like i know i'm kind of you know, saying the same thing, but like I was talking to other play, other, you know, guys my age or friends of mine that have kids around the same age. And, you know, mm-hmm. the, the first thing is, is like, oh, well, you know, they're going to play and they're going to do this and they're going to do that yeah. and yeah, yeah, this yeah. and this and this. And, and it's kind of like, I always say, listen, I just hope that he loves the game. That's it. Like he's going to be around it. He's going to watch it. I'm, sure. I, I can't, I can't make it stressful for him. Right. I just got to, you know, hopefully that, you know, when, when dad's watching film or dad's watching an NBA game or, you know, dad, right you know, he's watching dad. dad's games, he enjoys it and he loves it. If he loves it, then, you know, we can kind of make a push with it. Exactly. But, just, but, but you're not to one love. to, you're not one to just stick a ball and say, yo, this is what you're going to do now. Right. I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it to that. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to do my part. Like, <laughs> like, like, like the basketball is sure, going to be sure. in the crib, right? You know what I mean? If we can watch some, watch some ball, we're going to watch the ball first before yes. we put on the cartoons. Like, I'm going to do my part, but it's going to get to a point where, you know what I mean? You're going to know whether or not he has the love for it or he doesn't. Nice. And, you know, we'll know. And, you know, you're happy with whatever way it happens. I think that's what happened with me and, and my dad. I mean, he, him, Wade, him and Wade always brought Jaden and I to X camp every summer since we were four years old and it wasn't I'm sure the first year was when I don't even remember going probably wasn't in my my decision but like you said it's just bringing bringing that person around the game and allowing them to genuinely fall in love with the game is is what makes the difference because as we just had a whole conversation about it does come down to how much you love the game or how much you love something that's that's what you're going to devote your time and energy to Right. So, so I'm thankful that he, he did that because then I remember even getting back home after X camp and it wasn't straight to the video games or it wasn't straight to hang out with my friends and go get pizza. It was, I'm going to take what I learned from X camp and go in the backyard and, and keep, cause, cause I loved it. Right. 
So right. that that's huge, and, and uh, I think that that perspective is important um, with anything. But it it could teach a lot of people a lot of things, especially for themselves. If, if you don't love something, then find something you do or do something that you do love instead of something that you don't. Right. Right. TV. I don't um, know if I, I have anything else for you. Keep, oh yeah. Keep, yeah. No, keep I going, think, yeah. Yeah. On top of that, like, I want to go back to that love part in terms of just like please. team construction because please. Yeah. Like I know people put a lot of emphasis on, you know, playing and then because they're playing a lot of minutes, then you love the game. Right. Yeah. where I think people have to start in a team aspect of it. I think we got to start looking at it as, you know, you got to love your role. Hmm. Right. I think there's, there's a huge, you know, sometimes there's a huge discrepancy of, you know, everybody wants to be the guy to score 20 or, or play 25 That's minutes right. or 30 minutes. That's right? right. But you got to understand it's, 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 it's a team sport, right? You don't, there's no, you know, it's not track. It's not tennis. It's not nothing like that. You got to understand that you're going to have a role in terms of winning and being, you know, and us, right. you know, getting the ultimate goal. Because like I tell these guys all the time, I said, you know, we never won. I mean, two years I was there, we didn't win AUS, right? We went to the finals, um, and then the semifinals my last year, and then, but my the year we went to the finals, we lost to Acadia, went to the nationals, but then we won bronze, right? right. We won bronze at national. That's right. And you know, we didn't get the gold, but every time you know we have this conversation about winning or you know a team success, we talk about that bronze. That's right. right. We talk about being third in the country and um, like, that's what we remember. I don't remember what my stats were. I don't remember, I know. you know, how many minutes I played. Like I remember winning the bronze. So I think, you know, um, just with players growing up, like you got to understand that, you know, the off season is where you need to upgrade yourself, right? That's where you kind of change who you are, your positioning and everything. And then when you show up, when it's season time, you're competing. But then eventually it kind of comes in and you kind of form a role and you got to find a way or find find that love in that role to eventually, yeah, you have to love the game, but then also you have to love to win. So right. when you love, when you find that it's, it's a balance and it's tough and, you know, some guys Very are young tough. and it's hard for them to really figure it out. But yeah, I think, um, you know, um, like even with us, right? Like, you know, we're, we, we're talented and we have some, you know, there's, there's guys all over that can play at all different levels, but sure. you know, as a staff, we got to put the guys in certain situations to, um, to win games. And um, I think they, we just got to find a way to like, let's for us coaches, help them assist to find that, you know, um, that love in that role. Um, but at the same time, don't lose love for the game. Well, I, th I think, I think the system or team that you're on matters because like you said, growing up, it's just all about this competition and trying to be better than the person next to you. And it's, especially as a kid and just hooping on the, on, on the playground or playing one-on-one -on -one or this and that, it's just all about, I'm better than you, meaning I should have the ball in my hand or I could score the ball better than you. But it's like, when, when do players fi find this click where they're like, okay, basketball, if, if I want to be successful and win games, I need to accept the role. That's where I think the system or the, the culture of the team that you're on matters because that's what's, that's what's eventually going to teach the kid the value of accepting a role versus if, if a kid grows up and goes into a culture with a team that doesn't understand the value of that, it, that's just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And then that's when you get transfer players to come into a culture that does understand the value of role acceptance that's when they can just tear a team apart. Right. So, right. so how, exactly. like, how do you teach, how do you teach a kid that like, like, especially growing up? Well, it just comes down to, again, like you, again, it's a fine balance, but you got to understand that the game can kind of teach you things. So kind of my biggest, it's a, it's a kind of two parts to it, but kind of my biggest growth moments as a basketball player was when I didn't get, what I wanted. So like when I was, you know, I think it was my last year of high school um, uh, or second last year, maybe grade 12. And I was on the provincial team, Ontario provincial team. And they had an A team that ended up winning nationals and they had a B team. And the whole way out, I was slated to go be on the A team, be on the A team. And then, you know, last minute, 
I was put to the B team. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget it. It was um, actually uh, Roy Rana was uh, the coach of that t- yeah. the A team at that time. And he ended up taking some like Toronto guys. And I don't know, like for my background is I'm from Hamilton. And at the end of the day, it was like Hamilton and Toronto and we didn't really mix. Okay. Right. It was kind of like we were the, viewed as this, the younger brother in Toronto and Toronto had the marketing and the hype and stuff like that. We didn't have a lot of that, but we had a big chip on our shoulder. Um, so, you know, I got sent down to the B team and that killed me. Go home crying. Didn't know what, like, you know what I mean? Didn't know what to do with myself. I'd never been in a situation where I've been demoted in the sport of basketball. Right. But that summer was probably my best summer because now I had a reason to prove something different and say that I'm not the person that you think I am, right? And then, you know, I go into um, Silver Fox and I play Eastern Commerce, undefeated with Roy Rana, you know, being the coach there. I have 38 points in the game winning three and I'm literally looking at Roy Rana the whole game, right? So it's kind of like, like that's kind of, you know, it kind of pushes you to another level that you didn't know you had. So when you're going into a situation and you're in a role that maybe you don't like, right? You accept that role and you take that because I wasn't on the B team for Ontario saying, you know what? I hate it here. I don't want to be here. Mm. I don't, I want to get out of this, but no, no, no. I accept, I love the game of basketball enough to know this right. is where I am and I'm going to give the game what I need to give it and respect the game. And then when it's my time to go in the off season, I'm going to work harder than everybody else here so that the next year comes now I'm in a different position. And then the next year came and then I was an all Canadian. So it's just, it kind of just takes, you know, you may not get what you always want, but mm-hmm. just keep giving the game what you're supposed to give it to. And then, you know, then eventually if you don't, it's okay too, but at least you're giving the game everything you have so that you exactly. can look at yourself and say, okay, I gave myself everything this summer. I came back. I'm still, you know, maybe a, a six man or maybe I'm, you know, 10th, mm-hmm. but it's okay because I gave it everything that I could. And I'm looking at people ahead of me doing things that I'm not being able to do right now. So, but now it's just like, now, do you want to be that guy that's disruptive? Do you want to be that guy that's not a part of the team? Or do you want to be a part of that success and be a part of that team and be a positive part of that program? That's right. And the biggest thing that stuck out there for me was you respect the game. A lot of guys, like, and that ultimately comes down to your character as a person, because a lot of guys, and we've, we've both played with them, they don't get what they want. And then they just say F the world, this sucks, this is unfair, and I'm done, I'm quit, right? And, and that's when they throw in the towel. But, but if you can actually respect the game, then you'll follow in suit of what you just said, and you'll have that chip on your shoulder and be, and be out there, and it'll motivate you. It'll mo- motivate you to be, become better. That's, that's why people preach, and that's why there's all these famous quotes about failure being the best learning tool that there is in life, because it, it puts you in it puts you in new experiences and stuff that you haven't experienced before. And then it teaches, teaches you something that it teaches you a valuable lesson that you're going to, you're going to hold on to. That's, that's my whole thing with undressed the Jersey is, is that, I mean, there's all these different success stories and you go on any media site and all this stuff and you see the success, but what's not really talked about are the, are the things that got people there. That's why, I, a huge smile went on my face when you, you said, I remember this time and I'll never forget it because it's these distinct moments that define you as a person and, and, and teach you the values and lessons that you'll carry on and pass on to other people and allow you to do things that you didn't think you could do. So that's my whole goal with this brand and this platform sure. is to have that one specific story of you hitting that game winner and looking at Roy and I like, that's that's the exciting part of sport that I think needs to be highlighted a little bit more because those are the moments that you have such great learning opportunities and, and growth moments like that that's it yeah, for sure and I think you know like just like you kind of it's, it's cliche to say but you know you got to always find why you're doing what you're doing because like when I was growing up like there was no, like maybe it's, it's, it could be family circumstances, right? Like I grew up, you know, my, my parents separated, I was young, but then, you know, basketball kind of kept me close with my dad. So like, okay. that was kind of something that connected us. 
So like I wanted to do more of it and I want to be better at it because the better I am at it, the more people are going to be around. It, that's kind of how it started. Sure. And then it kind of got to, you know, now me and him kind of created a different type of relationship where now it's not just that, it's now also kind of like motivator and coach. Nice. So then now it's like, and he's always preaching to me, like, listen, you think you're working hard, but what about that kid that's, you know, New York City doesn't have running water in the house, doesn't have electricity. How hard do you think he's working to make sure that he gets out and he gets what he gets and he gets, you know what I mean, out of basketball, what he's supposed to get. So are you working as hard as that kid? Or have you put yourself in that scenario where you have nothing? And I, that kind of stuck with me a lot because now I'm always looking for little things to motivate me. So now I'm, in, you know, you know that all uh, the things on Instagram, like you're in the driveway, you're just thinking that an NBA guy's just going to drive up and take you to the, uh, take you to the to the Raptors stadium and you just start playing and be like, That's right. I used to do that That's all the time. Right. I used to visualize that all the time as a kid. And then, you know, you get a little bit older and then now, you know, you're playing kids, you're playing rep basketball and you're playing kids outside of, you know, your city. Yeah. And then that's something totally different. Now, now it's like, okay, you're something totally, like I remember um, the biggest, actually what kind of pushed me along too was Steph Curry was my age. Okay. And when, and when he was, um, when he was, uh, his dad was playing for the Raptors, he played for Toronto 5-0. And I was on the hand with the Wildcats and we were in the finals of almost every single tournament. Oh, wow. So, you know, and don't get me wrong. Steph could play back then too, man. He's probably averaging like 30 a game, shooting it from 40, like doing okay. all the same things he's doing right now, but he was doing it as a young kid. Um, but again, it was kind of like, you know, my dad was the coach at that time. And he's kind of telling me like, see, like mm. you see how he's operating. And then he's like, and don't get me wrong. Like there was, <laughs> there was one time um, we were playing. And I think, you know, I probably had like 15 and a half. Steph probably had like 10, 15 and a half. We were up going into half, and I never forget, Steph's mom yelled at him at the halftime and told him to come over to the stands. She was reaming into him for like literally like five minutes. And I remember not even listening to what my dad was saying. I was just listening. I was trying to just look at what was going on over there. <laughs> and, and he was just getting it from his mom. Came out second half. He lost by probably 20 points, and he probably finished with 50. Oh, my God. So it's like... You know what I mean? There was a different level of, like, you could see the love that he had for the game, but his family kept him accountable to that love. Like, if you're going to say you love it the way you love it, you don't take halves off. You don't take quarters off. You don't, right. you know, you give it every second that you have. And, you know, even so having that moment, that kind of pushed me in another direction as well. Like, no, no, I'm not doing enough. Because, you know, in Hamilton and, you know, when I was doing, I was, you know, OBA MVP two, three times, right? So it's like when I was young and then, now to see that there was another caliber that exactly. I had never seen before, now I gotta I gotta up it again, right? So, um, but again, it just comes down to, and then get to high school now. Now it's like, why are these guys in Toronto getting all this love, mm -hmm. and I'm not getting this love? I'm averaging 25 to 30 a night. Why is that guy over there that's 15 and I'm beating him in every tournament? Why is he getting more shine than I am? Yeah, so that's even building even more of a chip more on my shoulder, chip. like. Like why I got to do now even double to be from the city where I'm at to yeah. take what that guy in Toronto has. So, so you, just, you thought at the time it was because you were from Hamilton and not Toronto. Right. And if you were from Toronto, you'd be maybe getting the same love. But, but again, that goes back to the way, the way things work are the way they're supposed to. Like maybe you would never have been the player you, right. you were if you were from Toronto because then you would have, wouldn't have had that chip. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it was, again, like I think a lot of Hamilton guys growing up, um, you know, they get that, you know, they feel that a little bit, but just, it, it's not, it's not necessarily anybody's fault. It's just, that's where the media market is. That's yes. where they, it's close. Like people aren't going to travel to Hamilton all the time when the mark central market when Toronto the right media there. is in Toronto. So they're going to promote those guys a little bit more than they're going to pull him. But sure. I think that was a blessing for me because like you said, it kind of, gave me that little push to be like, I don't mean, that doesn't mean nothing to me. I'm going to make sure I show everybody. So when I do get into Toronto, they know who I am. Right. And, um, and I think with kids going forward and going through it, they got to find something that motivates them, that makes them uncomfortable. Like it's a summertime right now. There's COVID going on right now. It's very easy to, you know, work, stay at home, play video games, do what you got to do. 
no, just do the, so. just do the bare minimums to make sure you're somewhat in shape. You know what I mean? So you're not coming out looking like, you know, I've done nothing and there's, you know, but if you have something that motivates you, if you have something that, Hey, listen, I don't want people to say this about my name because my name matters. Mm -hmm. If that, if like, I think like that helped me too to know that, Hey, listen, me being the oldest, I got to set a standard for yeah. my younger brothers to know that our name means something and matters. Right. My dad used to say that all the time too. It's like, like, you know, it's the Vernon name. Like, what do you want the Vernon name to be known as? Sure. Right. And that makes it a little bit bigger. That makes basketball a little bit bigger than just go out there and have fun. Absolutely. It's, so, it's, um, it, it's accountability. And just like the story you shared about Steph is that his mom was holding him accountable. Right. And that was my biggest thing throughout high school was what's your why and why am I playing the game I am? and continue to rem remind yourself of that that's what's gonna make you get out of bed on days that you don't want to or say no to that friend who says yo let's go to the beach today it's 30 degrees like you just need to consistently hold you need to find a way that's going to hold yourself accountable and I think that's what that's what the best players are able to do is because they love the game so much and they respect it and they respect the fact that you need to put in the work in order to to achieve your goal right it just every everything that we've talked about is kind of coming full circle here and it like this is a conversation I can't wait for even university players to listen to or like obviously it's going to be valuable for younger kids and that kind of stuff but all of this just trans like that's where I believe sports is such a powerful tool for life because all of the lessons and values that we're talking about right now continue to apply to your life after you're done playing sport which which is your you're experiencing now and that's you know as a coaching job I can't help but think that the reason you went into teaching and then you wanted to continue to coach is because you want to pass on these values to the kids coming up now yeah that was that's was kind of the main thing and I didn't you know you again like you said like you know when you're all bought in you're it's like pro or nothing like, you know what I mean you're really like on your goal and you're like I gotta be a pro gotta be a pro gotta be a pro and you get there and then it's like, okay, now what's next? And, yeah. you know, what kind of helped me was um, kind of like in Hamilton, there was a lot of guys, like young kids coming up, they were very talented. So like I was going into and helping, you know, help practice every now and then when I could. And and those teams were like, again, like my, uh, my younger brother was on that team. Shea was on that, Shea uh, Gilders Alexander was on that team. So I'm with these guys on a regular basis. And then, I kind of took the liking to kind of the point guard side of it. So I would take, you know, my brother and I would take Shay and we would kind of work out and we would kind of, you know, I kind of, you know, let's talk about the ball screen. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then it got to the point where like, I was overseas and I was reading books. So I, I remember this, I would tell, so um, my brother and, and Shay, I would be like, listen, you guys are going to read this book. And until you're done two or three chapters, I'm not training you guys. So then they wow. would go home, they would read, and the, the, the book was um, uh, Mind a Gym, Mind Gym. So it was just kind of- Mind a, Gym, a, I, I, I have that book. Yeah, I have yeah. that book right around Yeah, the book. so that really helped me when I was kind of, you know, traveling overseas and just trying to, like, you know, get to know myself. And I said, you know, these guys are, these kids are very, very good, but they're just playing and they get angry, they get frustrated, they, mm. you know, they take themselves out for different possessions. So I'm like, you know what? This is kind of high level stuff, but let me try to give it to them a little bit younger so that, you know, maybe they can kind of grow into it. Maybe they don't understand it fully, but eventually they'll be like, I heard this before. I saw this before. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I think that was great. I remember actually seeing Shay's mom about um, maybe a year ago and she brings that up all the time. She's like, I nice remember one. when you gave those, gave those knuckleheads that book and made them read it and, you know, uh, you know, kind of get their heads right. But I think, um, but again, it's just trying to always, you see the love in these kids, but you want to make them uncomfortable and see if they can keep going to the next level, the next level. And that's the same thing that goes for us at X, right? I will, I will never just be comfortable wherever you're at. You're an all Canadian. Okay. Well, we need to, right. you know, if, okay, you're an all Canadian, but we lost. So far, we far too now? often guys reach this, these accolades and achievements. And then the next season they fall off, like, or they're not the same player because they get complacent. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, so that, so that's so powerful. 
uh, TV, uh, what are your immediate goals for say, like this upcoming year? Because how, like how, can you share any information that you have on next season? I know they are planning to start it in January and have a, what, 16 game season? Has that yeah, changed at still, all? It's kind of, it's kind of all proposed. There's nothing set in stone. Um, but uh, that's the plan. We're trying to get everything going for, you know, the start of the new year. Um, and then hopefully we can get a season and kind of finish it, you know, yeah, in so the how does, April period. So how is that affecting your approach, your approach to this season when you don't really know what it's going to look like or has it affected it at all? Are you just keeping it, you know, work as usual? You just, yeah, you try to keep it work as usual. Um, you're just trying to, you know, be ahead of, you know, just so you can kind of be informed before the players are, um, yeah. just to kind of help them out and try to guide them through the changes that are happening or what could happen. Um, but again, like in terms of, you know, first things first, we want to get these guys settled into school, get them into their courses, make them understand, okay, here's a school part. Let's, let's get that out the way. And then, you know, once they start opening up the gyms, then we'll start, you know, figuring out programming, what we're going to do, guys schedules and stuff like that, making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, but again, it's going to, this season more than most, it's going to come down to a lot of guys, you know, being self-motivated, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you have a lot of, you know, online courses, courses from home, not a lot of, not as much in-class courses. So now you have to have guys that go home and actually do their work. And then on top of that, they got to come back and then, you know, there's going to be slots during the day where they can get their workout in. They got to, you know, hold themselves accountable to that because like, you know, there's not going to be a lot of, there will be, but not as much dedicated times because the right. schedules are going to be a little bit off than they were the year mm. before. Um, but, uh, but again, like, I think, you know, with our team going forward, um, I think it, again, like it, it just comes down to guys accepting that role um, guys, again, like, you know, taking this time to find that love, you know, whatever, within whatever role they get um, and never being satisfied with where they're at. Like we, again, we, there hasn't been um, a banner up in, in, in St. FX for an AUS championship in a little while. And, you know, until we, until we get that, I'm, I'm not satisfied. Not satisfied. Right. right. Until we, until we get to, you know, that national level where we're seen as, you know, a perennial, you know, top three, top program in the country. Right. I'm not satisfied. So I think that, you know, like that's kind of something that hopefully that they can kind of take from me is that, mm -hmm. you know, until we get to that level, until we're, you know, we are, that's who we are on a day-to-day -day basis, not just getting there. It's, do we have championship values every day? Do we have the work ethic every day to mm -hmm. be that? Like, it was tough for me to just, like, being honest, like, you know, we lost a down in the finals and it was a close game and, you know, it, the ball could have bounced different ways and we probably could have got that win. But I just watched how Dow worked from the beginning of the season all the yes. way to the end of the season. And the way they dominated from the beginning, the way they dominated to the end, they deserved it. That's right. We had ups and downs the whole season. So if we got it, yeah, it would have been great. But I would have rather take it from the beginning of the season. We have it all the way to the end of the season. Mm -hmm. That's dominance to me. That's that's being a professional. That's that's what pro looks like. That's what loving business. the game yes. looks like. That's yes. I mean, like it's being consistent in what you do every day. And if we can get a roster to do that, um, I think that you know, I think we have the talent to do it. Um, now it's just guys again accepting that role, um, mm -hmm. understanding that the championship and winning is always comes first, and then you know everything else comes after that. Well, even just from this conversation, there's there's no doubt in my mind that you're the guy to be in this position. Because again, it goes back to my uh, remark about having that connection with your coach and you're already a personable person, but the fact that, you know, with your age, like you're going to be able to relate to these guys so much more. And then they're going to be someone that's going to draw inspiration from you. I think one of the biggest things for me, my last year was having Will Donko on the bench because he was someone that we could look up to. And then when, when he spoke, everyone listened because we knew that he was, he was in that position that we currently are. 
right? So, so, so that's that's just for me. That's always been something that I've I've valued as a coach or a mentor or a teacher, is someone that I can relate to and that I can believe in. So, uh, you're the guy, and I'm I'm excited to to follow along. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. This year is gonna be like as we know, it's it's up in the air. But I like the fact that you say it shouldn't matter. Guys should still be putting in the work as if it's business as usual. So um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to, you want to chime in and, and add. I, no, I was not, I think, I think, uh, listen, you're doing a great job, man. You're doing a platform for, uh, you know, basketball in the community and, you know, having people share their stories. And um, I think that's what the, that's what the kids need to hear. That's what the athletes mm-hmm. need to hear. Um, and just anybody in general, just to hear everybody's story, you're getting informed and you're understanding different perspectives from different people. And, and that's uh, it. I appreciate what you're doing and, um, yeah, keep doing your thing, man. I was, I was going to ask you, uh, how, how that golf swing is coming along. I was talking, I was talking to Daphne. She said, y'all, <laughs> y'all are up there swinging away. I'm waiting for my clubs to come in. I actually had to hit them up the other day. It's taking a little bit long, too long for me, okay, but uh, okay. yeah, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for the clubs to come in and then, um, We'll get there out, out there on a regular new, new That's challenge. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, TV. Now I really appreciate it, man. We'll be in touch. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right. My name is Tyrell Vernon, associate head coach, Santa Fe men's basketball. You were watching on Just the Jersey.